So I'm going to talk sort of very briefly and very generally about ECR perspectives on a lot of this stuff. Um, so just in case anyone's not aware, ECR stands for Early Career Researcher. And in this case, what I mean by that is not just postdocs, but also PhDs, who we've already heard a lot about today, and anyone in an equivalent role within industry. Um, so, you know, I think I don't have to convince anyone, given how much we've heard already, that ECRs are absolutely critical when it comes to the development and delivery of research software. We are the ones at the coalface, so I've put this lovely clip out of the coalface in. Um, so, for instance, we heard Michael talking about the absolute critical nature of PhD students to the development of their software. And realistically, I think this is usually because the majority of our time is available for research, so we can actually spend the time doing, doing the things that we need to do. Um, the job of the ECR might fall on a spectrum. Um, so you might have plenty of people in established teams who have excellent documentation. And as we've heard today, you know, many of these software packages have been around for 20 years. Um, but at the other end of this spectrum, we have people who are working on what might be the big software in the next 20 years. And at the moment, it's just them or them and a colleague. Um, and uh, yeah, they're sort of that maybe the support isn't in place so much for them. However, the general atmosphere and the, the funder requirements and things are moving towards open science. So even at that much smaller end, um, everyone, all ECRs really need these skills um, that go with open science. And actually the people at this sort of more independent working end are more likely to need that support from outside their, their group or their institution. Uh, as we've also heard, you know, we can expect technical domain specific knowledge from ECRs, but we can't immediately assume that they have the software development knowledge and particularly uh, development of in, uh, open science practices. Um, so we do really need to make sure that we're supporting them when it comes to that. But for, for ECRs, there's a massive career benefit to doing this. Um, and we've already heard how much uh, citations we can get from open source software. Um, and we're very keen to do it. And we have the time. Um, so really, I'm just making a case here for, first of all, supporting all ECRs, but also not forgetting those ones who um, maybe aren't in part of a big team yet, but, but one day will be. So what kind of challenges are we facing? Well, if we come back to this arbitrary spectrum that I've defined, uh, at one end, which I think is the left end, I've put people who are maybe working on their own or just with one or two colleagues. And one of their main challenges might be legacy code. Um, so you might have, uh, you might be a PhD student and the previous PhD student might have developed something and your supervisor goes, well, here you go, you can build upon this. Um, so already this might be poorly documented. It might have old dependencies or libraries that you no longer have access to. Worse, it might have been, this might have happened several times and you've got several different layers to unpack. Um, and it might be actually that if you're in a group that doesn't have the expertise in developing open source software, there might be a misconception from above about how much time it will actually take for you to uh, improve this code and make it suitable and open source. At the other end, um, you're working in a, you might have just joined a really good team that's been working on its software for 20 years and has very well established ways of doing things, in which case you're going to have to pick up on this stuff really quickly. And also, if you've been in one environment and you switch to the other, things are going to feel very different. Um, so it's just a case of being aware and, and providing general training uh, for, for both cases. Across the whole spectrum, um, a lack of training in general, particularly for people who've come from a non-software background, is a challenge. Um, and, and the support that they need, particularly if they're working in smaller groups or teams, they don't have access to, for instance, a research software engineer, which we heard about earlier. Um, and that's where a community like the one we're talking about today would come in really, really handy. In terms of the training needs that ECRs might have, um, there's, there's good programming practice in general. Um, so good practice when it comes to development, but also particularly if you're working with others. So collaborative things like version control. Um, but as the culture is shifting more towards open science, we need to also um, train all our ECRs really on things like um, testing, unit testing, compatibility and dependencies. So using things like software containers, um, appropriately visualizing their data, making good documentation uh, and maintaining their software. And one of the really important things about that is that's going to make it much easier for the next generation of ECRs coming into that code base to really hit the ground running and do some really good science. Uh, and also, I think it's important for the ECRs to be aware of the context in which all of this is taking place. 
So that really is all I had to say. I just want to sum up very quickly before I hand over to Danny, who's going to talk a bit more about a, a personal specific experience. Um, but I think, again, I don't need to convince anyone here that ECRs are key stakeholders in research software development. But everyone involved needs to have an appreciation of how much time that is required in addition to just doing their research um, that's, that's required to make things open and compatible and, and for everyone to be able to use. Um, but putting this time in and this training is going to have a knock-on effect on future ECRs and make all our science really great and shareable and everybody's going to get on to doing great research. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Danny Ramasawney, who's part of the UCL group, and he's going to talk a bit more specifically. So, um, yeah, as Amelia said, I'm going to talk about um, a toolbox I created called Elastic Matrix. Um, and this is going to be from the perspective of an early career researcher. So uh, a bit about me. Um, I am a postdoc at UCL and I'm fairly interested in elastic wave modeling and different numerical methods. And I'm situated in the biomedical ultrasound group. Um, and the biomedical ultrasound group develop um, K-Wave, which is an acoustic modeling software. So I'll give a, a quick slide on K-Wave. Um, so K-Wave is a MATLAB and C++ toolbox uh, for time domain simulation of acoustic wave fields. Um, and was created by Brad, Ben and Yuri. Um, so K-Wave is a well-established toolbox. Uh, it has 14,000 current users. Um, it's available, uh, it's been used in 70 different countries. It has like 4,000 forum posts um, and well over a thousand citations on its first paper. Um, so what were some of the reasons that um, Brad, Ben and Yuri decided to make their code open source uh, in the beginning was that uh, it makes your research reproducible. Um, so people can download your code and reproduce the results and methods that, that you're talking about and use it for their own research. Um, it's becoming uh, increasingly important as a contribution to science um, instead of just journal publications. And also in, in the beginning, especially for an early career researcher, it can improve your academic profile and the uh, visibility you have to people uh, possibly in adjacent fields um, as well as in your direct field. So I'm gonna talk about my toolbox, which is Elastic Matrix. Um, so this is a model for elastic wave propagation in multi-layered anisotropic media and it uses the partial wave method. Um, so why, why did I create a toolbox in the first place? Uh, well, first of all, um, during my PhD, I was modeling this planar fabry perot sensor. Um, I'm not gonna talk about too, too much about it, but it it's basically consists of multiple elastic uh, layers, and um, these are all uh, parallel. And if, if I, when, when I needed to model it, if I was going to use um, techniques such as finite element or finite difference, it would be very expensive computationally Whereas I can model this type of sensor and uh, uh, almost analytically using these multi-layer matrix methods, they're much lower cost. Um, so the method's been around for a while, but the existing tools were either closed source, they were limited, or they were very poorly documented. So it wasn't very easy for me to just take that code or whatever was existed and build it, uh, build upon it for my own um, PhD uh, analysis. And uh, as I said, this method is still widely used. So um, I thought it'd be very good to release this as a toolbox and make it open source for some of those uh, benefits that I mentioned before, such as the contribution and the visibility. So Elastic Matrix, as I said, is a model for elastic wave propagation in multi-layered anisotropic media, and it uses a partial wave method. So uh, I released a software paper earlier this year uh, in January, 2020, and it's been on file exchange since March, 2020. And in that time, it's had 86 downloads from file exchange uh, and, a, and a few more from GitHub, uh, but it's hard to count the downloads on GitHub. Um, and also it's got a couple of citations in the first few months. So some of the capabilities of this software, um, you can use it to calculate the LAM modes um, for different layered structures. And with them, you can calculate displacement and stress fields. Um, so for example, you can, you can calculate the uh, mode shapes from that. You can use it to calculate reflection transmission coefficients for layered structures and things like slowness profiles. Um, I chose to make the toolbox object oriented uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's uh, using, using object oriented code, it can be a very simple interface for the user. For example, you don't have to pass many uh, input arguments to each function or method. Um, it also allows me to change what's happening under the hood and improve the code uh, without changing the user interaction, uh, which is good for compatibility. 
and it, and it means it's easy for the user. They make less mistakes um, because there's a, a simple workflow. Uh, one of the main benefits is that it's extensible. So I can separate the, the bit, which is part of my PhD, which was modeling the, the sensors and the method, which is the, the partial wave method. Um, so it allows me to create a new class or, or different types of objects to, to model the problem that I am uh, trying to model. So how do you go from a script on your computer, uh, maybe that you're developing in your PhD or as, or as a postdoc and, and creating a software toolbox? Um, I think there's, there's a lot more to unpack and, and it's been mentioned before by previous speakers. Um, so the source code is like one part of it. You have the actual implementation, the performance, how much memory uses, how quick it is. Um, and probably which is done by most academics is that it's gonna be validated numerically and experimentally uh, before it's used for research or, or published. Um, so, but when you're developing it, it's important to consider things like the documentation. Um, you want a really low barrier to entry, I, I think, when you're using a toolbox, uh, from my experience of using other toolboxes. Um, so I've tried to make it so that you can just download the toolbox, you have an example script, uh, ex example script ready to go, uh, and then you can just change some parameters of that e example. So within minutes, you're, you're up and running. Um, also, maybe you will talk about the methods in the publications or, you, or you'll have a, a manual. And it's important to consider a coding standard because uh, unless you write to a coding standard, everyone has a different style and sometimes you end up changing styles while you're writing. So uh, that's very important Which uh, and having proper documentation like so that um, if your toolbox starts growing, you can just jump back into it very quickly and just read your documentation to understand what, what's happening there. Um, and also if other people want to develop on, onto the toolbox, they can um, pick it up very quickly. Uh, some other things to consider is the accessibility. So where do you host your repository? Do you, do you make it completely uh, public in GitHub? Um, so I've hosted mine on GitHub and on MATLAB file exchange, because these are probably two of the first places you'll look uh, for different toolboxes. Um, again, do you advertise through publications and conferences? Um, and having things like a website can be very helpful. Someone can look at the website and uh, see within minutes whether, whether it's gonna be helpful without having to download and compile or run your toolbox. Um, and considering what kind of interface you have, are you gonna have a scripting interface, uh, a, a like command interface, or are you gonna have a GUI uh, so people can click buttons? Um, and some things to consider are the way you develop it. So your version control, are you gonna do sort of continuous integration where um, people can, where, where you're adding new features all the time, or are you gonna wait and release it once a year um, with new features? And in fact, how do you even add new features? Do you, do you uh, create lots of branches in, in GitHub or, or uh, you can use issues in GitHub and stuff? And, th and this makes it much uh, better for making sure you always have a source code which is always stable and working and is compatible. Um, and also you can bring in new features and test them one by one. Um, so yeah, some of the conclusions and lessons I've learned, um, there are many of those areas to consider, which again has been uh, talked about by the previous speakers as well. Um, it's really good as an early career researcher to, um, as your contribution and improve your visibility of, of your research. Um, I've been lucky enough to be situated with the Biomedical Ultrasound Group and, and they have a well-established toolbox so I can build upon the experience of, of um, that and, and the lessons they learned when they started. And uh, something that I found very useful, so I've come from an engineering background, so it's been very useful to use the available resources such as online learning tools uh, like Coursera or LinkedIn Learning um, to fill in the gaps of your knowledge that you might not necessarily have, such as, in fact, just how to use GitHub, how to uh, use object-oriented programming or even web programming to create your website. And, and sometimes you can streamline some of these things. So GitHub provides something called GitHub Pages where you can very quickly from just a markdown script or readme scripts, you can, you can create a website for your toolbox. So using some of these resources can really cut out some of the time and some of the, the work that you have to do uh, when you're just starting.